So hello, Dr. Jones. Hello, Daryl. How are you today? I'm good. I hope you are too. And um, I'm, I'm going to go back and forth between calling you captain and doctor, because really, I mean, you wonderfully encompass both fields and, and do it for the benefit of your patients. Can you tell us more like specifically what kind of urologist you are and where you practice? Okay, well, uh, thanks for inviting me, Daryl. Uh, I, I'm at the Baylor College of Medicine, uh, primarily as a, on the faculty as a professor of urology. I'm, I have a joint appointment with the Center for Space Medicine here at Baylor. Uh, I'm the chief of urology at the Mike Lee DeBakey VA Medical Center. And my training is in the area of urologic oncology. So that's what I do primarily. But uh, of course, we take care of other urologic problems uh, at, the, at the VA as well. Uh, and so I'm not limited to only oncology, but that's my uh, my fellowship training and, and uh, research interest. Uh, I'm also, as you mentioned, uh, captain in the United States Navy Reserve. Uh, I'm currently the wing surgeon for the Command uh, Fleet Logistics Support Wing, uh, and have had assignments uh, as a flight surgeon uh, across the, the gamut uh, from uh, a Marine Corps light attack to uh, uh, Hornet squadrons, uh, C-130 Herc squadrons. Uh, I've done some time with uh, the Air Force uh, and uh, Vipers and Eagles. And so I've had a kind of a wide array of aviation platforms I've supported through the years. That's super. And uh, do you also uh, work with astronauts in the Space Force? That's new. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when I, I spent 13 years as a NASA flight surgeon uh, with uh, Johnson Space Center and uh, as a crew surgeon for shuttle missions and for the International Space Station, and then uh, worked uh, for a while as the lead for the uh, uh, Constellation Medical Operations Exploration Medicine Program. Great. And um, your service was, uh, what bases did you serve at? Well, uh, quite a few over time. Uh, I started out in Fleet Hospital. I was with Fleet Hospital 21 and uh, that's based out of, I was based out of Great Lakes because I was doing my residency in Indiana at the time. And, uh, I then I transitioned uh, uh, in Naval Air Station uh, uh, at Bell Chase in New Orleans, uh, working with uh, MAG-42 and HMLA-775, HMLA-773. Uh, and from uh, MAG-42 to MAG-41, and there was Naval Air Station Fort Worth uh, supporting uh, VMGR-234 and for quite a while VMFA-112. Uh, when I was on active duty uh, with uh, OEF, uh, during OEF, uh, VMG-234 so was supporting operations out of uh, uh, Afghanistan, Kandahar. Um, I did also a tour in Westpac and we supported in, uh, in uh, Okinawa and uh, Guam. Uh, Northern Australia uh, during the, the Westpac tour, uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, we, I was stationed at Al Assad uh, and uh, was with MAG 26. Uh, but uh, I actually flew with mostly with uh, uh, MAG 3 and uh, MAG 3 and 4, which were both Prowler squadrons. And uh, then uh, with uh, VMFA 112, I was there primarily, and then also VMGR uh, 552, I believe it was, uh, that uh, was uh, stationed there with us. And then we also had a couple of Marine Corps squadrons uh, that were light attack uh, that I did some time with. And we did, we did air evac missions uh, from various locations, uh, uh, HIT, uh, Ramadi, Fallujah, et cetera, from those locations to Al-Assad. And then uh, sometimes I work with this, the C-60s, uh, uh, the Air Force platforms to uh, uh, take the H-60, sorry, to take the folks from Al-Assad to Balad, where we had a uh, kind of a tertiary care facility. So the, the combat, you know, the, the casualty receiving area for the cash there at Al-Assad would stabilize the wounded, and then we would move in there to Balad, and then from there they would they'd go to Ramstein. Right. So the idea of flight surgeon and urologist seem counterintuitive. Uh, like, I mean, I mean, were you doing, um, well, what reconstructive surgery? I mean, what were you doing as a urologist specific to those theaters? Well, uh, most of the time when I was in theater, I was there as a flight surgeon. Uh, and uh, and so my, most of my duty was supporting the air crew. 
Uh, <laughs> now, it's 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 not unusual for flight docs to take on uh, ancillary roles, uh, and, and we have um, what we call collateral duties in the military for for your military audience. And so, my collateral duty when I was in Al Assad, for example, was as an uh, an ECMO electronic countermeasure officer, and uh, I I flew typically ECMO two or ECMO three and the Prowler, and I would run jamming pods or do com between you know spec ops and the aircraft during missions uh, to uh, help the, you know the flight crew uh, coordinate our support of, of the ground operations. So I'm sitting here and to- I mean, we started in a conversation off record saying, you know, that I envied your career. Now I'm like blown away by the opportunities you've had to do service and also just the extraordinary variety of stuff to do, you know, and, and interest that you had in this. Thank you. you. Know? Well, but, but to finish your the question. So when I was in uh, Al-Assad, uh, so the uh, cash was able to credential me uh, and I did some you know, ER shifts as a uh, uh, triage officer, you know, when we're doing casual receiving uh, uh, as, as part of my role, because I actually had a general surgery training as well. But uh, I did manage to squeeze in about, I think, 15 uh, air crew vasectomies that wanted to get them done and wanted it while they were uh, on active duty said, hey, uh, not doc, can you knock this out for me? So that was kind of the running joke. And I actually trained to several of the other docs that were there at Al-Assad. Uh, with me from various services on how to do the operation and our, our Marine aviators who wanted to get clipped while they were, uh, while they were in, in, in t- on the tour. <clears throat> well, I mean, I suppose there's a whole nother video we could do on that. <laughs> yeah. So not to get off track, but it just occurred to me, uh, I mean, do they do PSA tests in theater? Yeah, typically in theater of uh, active combat, uh, that's not the kind of test we would routinely offer. And it's not that it's impossible to do and the laboratory facilities at our theater hospitals are quite capable, but uh, that would not be considered a kind of a standard test in a, in a theater of combat. Uh, you would want to do that sort of testing before the individual deployed into theater. Uh, so you, if somebody had a concern that they might have a prostate cancer, you would want to know that before you sent that person into a theater, combat theater, and then uh, evaluate it and deal with it prior to sending them and then wait till they get back for, for those kinds of things. Now, if somebody was deployed overseas for extended period, yes, we certainly offer that at our OCONUS uh, outpost, uh, uh, especially if it, we're talking about the larger medical centers like you would have uh, in um uh, in Okinawa or in uh, Iwakuni, or if you were talking about our, our European theater operations, anything near, you know, the the Ramstein facility and, and our bases in uh, in Sicily and uh, in uh, uh, Naples, you know, Spain, Barcelona, area, uh, th- that part of the world all have access to laboratory studies that would include PSA for the routine. Uh, screening, health screening of not only aviators and military uh, personnel, but for even some of the contractors that do full-time military support, they have access to healthcare facilities at those bases that can provide that kind of service. But in terms of combat theaters, we wouldn't routinely draw that. uh, Okay, great. So let's start from the top down in terms of you know, just prostate cancer stuff. And by top, let's go to the space station, you know, and the space shuttle and such. There have been, I mean, there are astronauts with prostate cancer. There are astronauts that have been treated. Um, uh, Do do you have any personal, I mean, obviously, you know, to the extent you can talk about, you know, do you have a personal experience with uh, working with uh, astronauts with prostate cancer? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, a number of astronauts have had prostate cancer and have been operated on for prostate cancer and have suffered from prostate cancer. Uh, and uh, we have been able to get crew members who had prostate cancer who were treated and were rendered NED with no evidence of disease uh, approved for spaceflight. And, uh, and there are a couple of folks that 
have gone public with their uh, diagnosis. And so I'm not speaking out of turn and talking about them, but I've been involved with the diagnosis and, uh, and treatment of, of uh, several astronauts. Some of our Apollo astronauts uh, were some of the first uh, to be diagnosed and be treated. Uh, and then the Kelly twins, uh, Mark and Scott, uh, uh, have, have gone public. They've appeared at, at meetings like at the AUA, the American Neurologic Association, and talked about their prostate cancer and uh, you know identical twins uh, diagnosed very close in time to one another. Both of them uh, with uh, you know with active flight status and it affected uh, you know mission assignments, et cetera. But both were able to be um, uh, treated and then uh, uh, approved a, a waiver to go back into flight status. So that's the success story that. The concern, however, is why have so many astronauts and why have so many aviators in general, because both Mark and Scott were maybe naval aviators before they became astronauts, why are so many getting prostate cancer? I think that's an extremely important question. So talk about it. What's <laughs> well, I, I wish I knew the exact answer, but I can give you some theories and things we're working on. And we are engaged in a study. Uh, to look at some of the uh, molecular changes that might be present, what, what we call epigenetic effects of the military service that might be predisposing them to cancer. So you can talk about genetic effects, things that you're born with, and then things that might be developing in the way your genes express themselves. And we call those epigenetic effects that could uh, change your risk. And so we think there might be things that the individual uh, military personnel are exposed to that would would affect their gene expression and therefore be epigenetic changes. Things, for example, of <clears throat> methylation of their DNA, putting methyl groups on the, the backbone of your genetic code to change the way it's read. That could be an example. Uh, but there are many other things like perhaps we're damaging the DNA or we're damaging the cell membranes from these exposures. And then you say, well, what kind of exposures would, would do such a thing? Um, there are many such things. That's why it's gonna be hard to nail it down. And I'll, I'll put them into different classes. And so uh, for the aviators, we suspected it might be radiation related. So there could be radiation from what's captured in the Earth's geomagnetosphere from very high altitude flights. So if you're flying in like a U-2, aircraft and you're going on very high altitude missions, you may be getting some trapped radiation exposure. If you're flying polar routes near the poles, like over the pole from, from northern United States over to Europe, we often go polar and there you're going to get more of the auroral horns of the geomagnetosphere as the, the magnetic bands come down towards the pole. Uh, there's an area where the trapped radiation is much higher in density. Uh, in, in space flight, they fly through an area called the South Atlantic Anomaly that's below the geomagnetosphere, the way that the geomagnetic uh, uh, trapped radiation dips down closer to the surface of the planet and the spacecraft goes right through it. And that's another place where you could get exposed. Uh, there's also exposure on your uh, 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 aircraft platform, depending on what you fly in. For example, if you fly in the A-10 Warthog, you might have a round in your arsenal that is, uh, you know, has depleted uranium in it. And depleted uranium, while much, much less radioactive than the original uranium, it's still mildly radioactive. And so it could be a source. The other thing is uh, like the, the prowler or the modern day growler that's taken the prowler's place. place. It's no, no longer we use the, in the Navy, we don't use the uh, EA-6 Bravo, which was used during uh, uh, Desert Storm and uh, Rocky Freedom, but we use a, an F-18 platform, electronic countermeasures platform called the Growler. And so those platforms, they put out a lot of electromagnetic radiation because they're actually designed to take out enemy radar capabilities or their communication capabilities. And so they put out a very strong signal and it's very directional and potentially <clears throat> some of that radiation may be uh, exposing the crew. Plus the radars themselves are fairly large 
uh, size radars, uh, especially in like the Eagle, it goes way out and, and uh, it's got a lot of power. And so there's a lot of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation that flight crews are exposed to as well. And we know from just assessing some radiation related effects. So one of the things we measured at NASA and compared it to military aviators was the incidence of cataracts in the eye. We see these lenticular opacities, so cloudiness of the lens of the eye that come from a specific type of radiation exposure. And they're much higher in astronauts than they are in military aviators, higher in military aviators than in civilian aviation crew, and then higher in civilian aviation crew than the general public. So there's something about the flight environment that predisposes to cataracts, and we think that it's due to radiation. So that's one of many potential sources. There's other sources that are chemical in nature. And we know that uh, like in the aviation world, uh, uh, some of these composites uh, shed cadmium, that's you know, part of the, uh, the composite structure of the vehicle, uh, includes cadmium, which is a known carcinogen. Uh, there's a number of different solvents and cleaning solutions that are used for aircraft parts uh, that include maybe benzene, toluene, and some of these other aromatic hydrocarbons that could be a source of carcinogenesis. Uh, there is um, uh, exposures that weren't necessarily well um, characterized before we went into theater, but we learned about later uh, dust uh, and some of the, the contents of the dust, like in Iraq especially, uh, and then uh, in, in Iraq, we had a, a big issue, and I think the same is probably true of some of the bases in Afghanistan uh, with these big open burn pits. And we were burning everything that needed to be destroyed in those burn pits, and the, and the effluent, the smoke was coming out of the burn pits and blowing across the base. And every day, there would be a large puff of smoke that the burn pit was operating that would, would envelop uh, al-Assad, depending on the wind conditions. And so I think all of those things potentially could be sources of epigenetic-induced carcinogenesis. Yeah, might there be sort of an intersection of all of those sources that one particular, you know, whether it's a, a cadmium or, you know, perhaps non-ionizing and toxic radiation or something, individually, they may have limited to no effect, which is why people may deem them safe for for personnel for people but combined over and over periods of time they become really instigators of, of cancer episodes does that make sense yeah and, and when i was at nasa we used to talk a lot about <clears throat> stochastic versus deterministic effects and so you know some things seem to have a threshold so you get a certain dose and below that you're safe but as soon as you get above that dose then you pass the threshold and you're going to get a, an effect. And some things, we don't know exactly what the threshold is, but we think more is worse. And so we try to just keep it as low as we reasonably can. Uh, and I don't know that we have a clear indication of which of those effects may be stochastic and which ones are deterministic. Uh, but the idea that there may be some synergy, uh, some combinatorial uh, effect on epigenetics is probably a valid um, idea, and I think it deserves more attention, but it is hard to study because there's so many potential combinations of things, and how much do you know, how much of one versus the other, and, and how much of this dose is, is uh, below the safety threshold versus above the safety threshold versus something else, and then looking at them collectively is is the sum of the parts more, is the whole the more the sum of the parts? And, and I don't know the answer to those things. I think these are all valid research uh, questions that we need to pursue. Yeah, and in preparing for today's talk, I mean, I did a PubMed search and did my usual diligence and everything. I found lots of interesting and some challenging to read papers on specific items, specific molecules that, and exposure levels and such. I found nothing on like the synergy of things, you know, and I think perhaps the, the best source for information of that is patient population within our support groups. We have a number of guys who 
don't say, I believe it was my exposure to uh, dry cleaning fluid at Camp Lejeune or my burn pit experience at Jibati or something like that. It was their day-to-day life. One guy put it really eloquently, like, I, re- I hope I could, now I'm going to have to paraphrase it. But the idea that, you know, you rarely get, sh- he would, so he was in Def- Desert Shield uh, operation de- in uh, Gulf War, and he did Southwestern Asia deployment uh it's like twice or something and, but and he said he he rarely worried about you know he well he worried but he he wasn't ex- exposed to getting shot at or you know uh, explosive devices or incoming things or outgoing things but he was exposed day to day by the fumes from the burn pit which was like a kilometer or two from where he said he was like you know s- sleeping you know and and he was exposed to fuel you know, he was a helicopter guy, you know, an uh, air crew. Uh, he was exposed to, and let's talk about that in a brief second, but the idea that our patient population and our support group network are really the most marvelous source of understanding exposures and exposure tolerance and are prime examples of the failure to protect our personnel adequately. And even if we're not even if none of this plays out in truth that all of these exposures are safe the fact that we haven't investigated this sufficiently to put people's minds at rest that they could sleep at night not wondering if the quality of their service has screwed them up in their mature years you know i mean that's a shame let's talk about gonna, go just, ahead yeah. i would say the, the spin off on that that uh that thought there um uh, one of the things that we have been fortunate enough at, at our VA in Houston is to receive some funding from the Prostate Cancer Foundation in concert with the VA, what they call the Valor Grants, uh, to study the effect of Agent Orange as an example. We, we were talking about some of the chemical uh, exposures. Now, we haven't had Agent Orange in the inventory for quite a long time, but these exfoliants and these uh, dichlorobenzol uh, benzene and uh, the biphenols, bisphenols, uh, these types of compounds uh, that have been used for various purposes, but primarily in Vietnam as a, as a, uh, a means of uh, uh, reducing the, the vegetative population so they could find the enemy. Uh, that particular compound seems to have a clear association with the risk for prostate and so we're just trying to figure out how it does that. You know, what is the mechanism that uh, leads to uh, the the added risk of prostate cancer in somebody that's been exposed to Agent Orange? Uh, and now you're you, we're bringing up a whole bunch of new things because we don't even know what the components are of burn pit smoke. I mean, they burn so many different things, uh, everything from. Uh, uniforms to body parts. I mean, it's like there's just a wide array of things that were burned in those burn pits. And so um, we don't even know what the chemical composition, it, it probably wasn't uniform. It probably was variable day to day on what was what was being produced. But you can be almost assured there, there was some uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and some aliphatic hydrocarbons and probably uh, a number of other heavy metals that were liberated and all of those things have potential carcinogenesis. And so if you add those exposures onto some of the more routine things, because it's not like your risk of cancer is zero if you don't have exposures, right? You know, our, our inherent risk of cancer across the board is somewhere between 20, 25% you know, over your lifetime that you're going to get cancer. And so what we're talking about is additive risk on top of the baseline. And the baseline risk is, is a combination of our genetics plus our environmental exposures. And that varies anything from our water source, the air we breathe, the food we eat. I mean, all of those pesticides in the environment, uh, there are so many things that can contribute to that. And that's why it's really <clears throat> challenging to tease out all of those exposures to those that are unique to the military. So. And even though I promised that this would not be a doom and gloom conversation, I, I'll figure out a way out of this. But <laughs> the, the once somebody's diagnosed with prostate cancer, does it matter where the source was in terms of treatment choices from day one forward? 
Well, what matters is the aggressiveness of the cancer. So we tend to try and characterize a man's prostate cancer with how likely it is to progress clinically in their lifetime. <clears throat> and and it, sometimes it depends on the age of the individual when they're diagnosed. And if there's somebody who's, say, 90 years old and they, they have a terminal illness and they're only going to live another year or two, uh, the urgency to treat their prostate cancer is extremely low because the chance that the prostate cancer will affect their life is, is quite small. <clears throat> but if for the man's 45 or 50, like some of our astronauts have been when they were diagnosed, <clears throat> and they uh, have a moderately or significantly aggressive cancer, the chances of them dying of their prostate cancer is quite high. <clears throat> and so those individuals need aggressive therapy or they could, because they have aggressive disease, or they have disease that could result in loss of life and loss of um, useful years of uh, service. And so for those individuals, we're going to be much more aggressive with therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, compared to someone who may be elderly, have other comorbidities, or have a very low aggressive prostate cancer low on the aggressive scale. And we call that the Gleason scoring or Gleason grade group. That kind of puts it into a risk bucket by scoring its appearance and the PSA level and some of the staging that we do. All of these things give us an indication of how aggressive the cancer is going to behave. And based on that, we prescribe therapy accordingly. And sometimes we just watch it. We do what's called watchful waiting or active surveillance if we think it's a relatively low aggressive uh, tumor, and we're not going to uh, uh, subject the individual, the man, to to side effects of therapy if if their risk from the cancer is relatively low. Right, but I guess what I was asking was, does it matter whether somebody's prostate cancer may in fact have been related to some aerosol or inhale something they inhaled as a consequence of being next to a a burn pit for a couple of months or being on a flight crew and inhaling burnt jet fuel uh, or, um, you know, a motor pool thing and having some obscure lubricant, perhaps something with mercury in it or something like that, you know, some endocrine disruptor of some sort. Uh, does that matter for the guys that are, that are listening to this today who are diagnosed with prostate cancer? Well, generally not, because it's this aggressiveness uh, kind of risk assessment that's more important for us to, from a therapy standpoint. It matters from a couple other reasons. It, it, it certainly will be helpful for us to know how these things cause cancer for, for us to work better in the preventative realm. So knowing the answer to the, the question you're answering would be helpful from that standpoint. Number two is uh, I think that the chemically induced cancers are more likely to be aggressive than say a sporadically naturally occurring cancer. We don't know that for certain, but that's kind of the general gestalt at this point in time. But the, the important thing would be, is the condition service connected? And that's important to the, to the veterans who have an opportunity to have all of their care provided without cost at the VA and to have uh, the VA also provide them with some compensation for their condition. Yes, it, de it depends on what the cause is. If, if it can be shown that the condition that they have is service connected and that applied to their VA compensation and pension plan, then it could mean financial resources available to the veteran as opposed to some sporadically occurring event that would have happened whether or not they were in the military or not. Yeah, and I could hear our brothers in England and in Canada and Australia not snickering, but sort of feeling sorry for their American brothers that they have to go through all this because those guys, you know, most countries, their national health service takes good care of them. You know, we're the ones that have to jump through hoops and, and sort of prove things. I don't think the burn pit uh, thing is uh, one of those presumptive causes. Is that correct? No, it's it's not listed right now as a clear-cut association with any specific disease. 
like as an example, and you bring that up, uh, when when my squadron and actually all of the squadrons that were uh, with that uh, that flight line aid station that I was the uh, OIC for uh, that were in theater, I made sure that we documented. Uh, in each of those Marines' medical records, uh, exposure to the burn pit from a specific date to a specific date. And we also asked for the environmental health officer reports to be included in those medical record documents. So it would be very clear if at any point in time in the future, those Marines developed a condition that might be you know, attributable to the burn pit exposure that we would have record of. So those Marines have that in their chart, at least for the ones that were, uh, it, were you know, associated with flight squadrons uh, at that period of time when we were in Al-Assad. I don't know about the other flight docs and what they did for their particular aviators, whether they be Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Army. They were all there at Al-Assad over the, over the years. Um, but uh, the uh, exposure... Um, quantification was very hard. I tried to get the EHO to provide some kind of smoke density assessment. They could actually look at, they have sensors that uh, like that are used for uh, fire alarms that can measure the density of the obscuration of a little laser as the smoke blows through. And so they can get some idea as to how dense the smoke is. And unfortunately, we didn't have those sensors all over the base to be able to quantitate what any one area of the base was getting over time, that would have been hugely helpful if you wanted to try to do a quantitative assessment of how much exposure those those Marines or those uh, soldiers or airmen had while they were in theater. Uh, but the, 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 the burn pit um, carcinogenesis potential is also not known because the composition of the smoke is not purely quantified. It's the, we, we don't know how much of each component. We don't know which components because they varied day to day. Should we be angry about burn pits? You know, from a healthcare professional standpoint and from the standpoint of being an aviator who was in theater and had to, to deal with that, I'm upset about it. And I think that, uh, uh, I think that it's very legitimate that other uh, DOD uh, medical personnel be upset about it because I think that it was an avoidable exposure. Uh, and from a standpoint of the DOD, you know, uh, the Department of the Navy, the Army, Air Force, and the DOD in general, um, I understand the need for those types of, of um, uh, ability to eliminate things that they didn't want to fall into the wrong hands. And I understand it had to be controlled. In other words, it had to be on the base. You couldn't like take it out 10 miles from town and be outside the wire, outside of the protective zone and, and have your people be at risk of, uh, of some, uh, you know, a sniper fire or other untoward uh, event as a result of being out of the protected zone. So it was a tricky situation. Uh, and, uh, they certainly don't want to leave it there. Uh, there are a lot of things that were, were weapons, for example, or other things we didn't want the enemy to have access to. Uh, and there were some things that were a, a health risk themselves unless we got rid of them. And so burning them is a fairly way to reduce that risk without having to you know, cart off via aircraft or some other way to get them out of the base. And so I understand why that was a popular solution from a DOD perspective, but uh, at the same time, it seems like we could have done them in a way that would have contained and filtered the smoke rather than having them be open to, to fill the air that the, uh, the population on the base had to breathe. Yeah, and the surrounding civilian population as well. Yeah, Plus, they, right. they're going to be dealing with the remnants of those pits for generations, I imagine, much like people in Vietnam yeah. are dealing with dioxin uh, consequences today. Yeah, the dioxins and the Agent Orange, right. Yeah, you know, we talk about was, uh, the uh, you know, and certainly Iraq, Afghanistan, um, 
you know, that's becoming a was situation. But in Djibouti, which is like one of the largest air bases in the world now, I guess, uh, I mean, there's still burn pits, as far as I know. You know, I mean, we have one guy who came to a group in St. Louis uh, before uh, COVID. Uh, uh, he had retired uh, a year or two earlier. He was early on the, he was like an engineer with drones or something. And uh, he was talking about burn pits within his support group. And I learned about this from the support group leader. And, you know, he, you know, he was just a pissed off guy, you know, I mean, he, you know, appropriately, I think, you know, because like, what did we learn in, in 1990s? What did we learn in 2010s? What did we learn, you know, in 2015s? Apparently not much, you know, or is it about there's less concern? And from his point of view is cancer. And he was a young guy, you know, like, you know, apparently in his he 40s. He cancer as a young guy? What yeah. I mean, and that, that's actually another question, which we'll, I'll hit you on in just a second. The idea that um, he should feel angry, I think, is a healthy response to all of this. You know, people listening to this who wonder, you know, I, my, my service, I did my job. It was a job. And I, I, I feel almost convinced that job led to my diagnosis, you know, and now it's not just threatening my life. It's also threatening, you know, I mean, it screwed up the quality of my life, you know, morbidity, you know, oh, you know the, so, yeah. See, um, idea about young versus old. I mean, in the literature, there seems to be a suggestion that, um, well, that veterans seem to seem to present, you know, at a younger age with a higher Gleason score. Um, is that your experience among flight crews and such? Well, um, I don't think we have hard data yet to, to make that presumption. I mean, I, I actually, we're seeing a general trend with higher Gleason scores, higher aggressiveness scores on uh, individuals in general. In, in neurology, it seems that, and I don't know if, you know, we did change the grading system not too long ago. Uh, but it seems like a larger percentage of those we're operating on are in that higher grade group than there used to be in the past. And uh, we're seeing less, you know, Gleason 6 and 3 plus 4 than we used to. And we're seeing a lot more, you know, the higher Gleason uh, scores or the higher grade group uh, than in the past. Uh, now, I, I do most of my time over at the VA, so I am a little bit skewed from that standpoint. But uh, uh, what I'm hearing is the same is true in the, in the civilian side, in the private sector as well. Uh, they're seeing a lot more of the higher risk prostate cancer. And so there may be something else going on environmentally that uh, we have to worry about. Um, but uh, I think that uh, uh, your, your point of uh, is a younger person uh, an indication, if a younger person gets a cancer, is it more likely an indication that their exposure led to that? That's not always true. Uh, the men that have cancers in their family are more likely to have uh, cancer when they're younger because they had that genetic predisposition. So they're already kind of pre-wired towards cancer because of an inherited mutation, for example, or a defect in their, in their genetic structure that led to that. Whereas um, someone with a sporadic cancer, uh, I think the exposures are very important. And if somebody gets it when they're younger, a lot of times that cancer is more aggressive and we have to be more aggressive with therapeutics to prevent it from progressing, as opposed to an incidentally found, you know, Gleason 6 low risk prostate cancer in an 85 year old, uh, which we typically don't treat very aggressive. Yeah. And in a way, we're now sliding into good news that, it, you know, younger guys may have the, uh, the uh, I mean, the dominant issue may be a genetic uh, inherit, you know, inherited inheritance rather than exposure, uh, a toxic exposure. Let's talk about uh, sort of bring smiles to people's faces a little bit as we close this out. The idea that you really get good care in the VA. 
I mean, the myth of bad care is just a myth. I mean, we've been, uh, our organization's been around for 22 years and people will complain and certainly appointment making is a struggle, but that's true at NCI cancer centers. That's true with brand name doctors. You know, I can't see, you know, uh, you know, you know, I, as a, as a head of a major organization in the prostate cancer world, I'm not going to get an appointment tomorrow, you know, with brand name doctor, you know, I mean, I'll be waiting and I'll complain about that. But I mean, that's just part of the nature of the beast, so to speak, in the United States and perhaps in other places as well. But the quality of care is extraordinary. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, I, I agree with you completely. And I have to admit there was uh, some very negative publicity about the uh, Phoenix VA. And it was kind of used a little bit as a political football uh, about uh, the quality of care. And I, I certainly think that there was some issues with appointment <clears throat> prioritization and uh, a length of, of wait to get an appointment uh, at that time. But I can tell you, after the last administration, the, the time to get an appointment within the VA is now less than the general community. And so if you compare it head to head, it's it's you're more likely to get an appointment within 30 days in the VA than you are with uh, general community appointments for urologic care and for specialty care in general. So I agree with you with that, that, that uh, the, the issue or the myth that you can't get an appointment uh, is, and the VA is is no longer true. When it comes to the quality of care, I guess there probably is some variability, but I could say at the tier 1A VAs, uh, the, the VAs that are affiliated with academic medical centers around the country, uh, I think the care is world-class. I think it's as good as you can get anywhere. And then you can go through and start asking about specific technologies. And I can tell you about things that we do at our VA, they're not even done in our community hospital. Well, we, we set the, the standard of care and our care is as good, if not better than any other facility in the country and probably the world for that matter. You know, I just give you some examples, you know, things like uh, new technology, thulium laser. We have a thulium laser in our VA. They don't have it in the community practice. We were the first ones to have 120 watt laser in our community. We were the first ones to have blue light for bladder cancer detection in our community, in our state, at the first VA in the country, obviously. But I mean, the there are so many examples like that. We have two XI uh, dual workstation robots in our VA. We do single port donor nephrectomies with 3D endo eye viewing laparoscopically at our VA. I mean, these are things that most community hospitals don't have. So we offer state-of-the-art care with fellowship trained faculty supervising all those cases for our veterans, working with our resident physicians. So we have an educational mission. We're training the next generation of surgeons. At the same time, we're offering our veterans state-of-the-art care. Yeah, and, and that quality of care is matched by access to care, which is, I think, one of the causals, the uh, really cool ones, to re about the uh, reducing the disparity that black men face with uh, uh, versus white men. Prostate cancer in general world in the United States, at the very least, uh, kill, prostate cancer kills black men at 2.4 times the rate as white men. It's an extraordinary statistic. You know, we've been, you know, we have a, the twice as many program, which works on that. But within the VA system, within the military care, within active duty, within retired people getting their care on on bases in the United States, that disparity in terms of outcome, in terms of morbidity and just quality of care, that dissipates to where it's negligible at, at worst, you know, and, and non-existent at best, which is to say black men and white men, when given it seems to be, no one's really done really proper investigation, you know, black when you, when you have equal access to high quality care, disparities are irrelevant or disappear. Well, uh, yeah, it's, I wouldn't say irrelevant. I would say right. right. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. They, they diminished dramatically. So, 
I think that you brought a point. There's clear disparity in outcomes currently in the African American population versus either Asian or Latin or Caucasian American, European American uh, individuals in our country and, and around the world for that matter. However, uh, if you look at populations like the VA and uh, the uh, active duty, when they have equal access, that number diminishes dramatically. In some cases, you can't see a statistical difference between them. Others, that there's still a little bit of disparity <clears throat> that exists, but it may not be access related. We, we're trying to actually understand it. Uh, there may be some cultural issues, and and uh, and we've looked at do do black men, for example, come to the doctor later, uh, or do they delay treatment, or is there something culturally, socioeconomically, diet dietary that might be increasing their risk that might alter that disparity slightly? So there still may be other factors that allow a disparity, even if access is equalized. But it seems like access to care is a huge factor in that disparity. And that once you you equalize the access, then the disparity goes way down. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's, it's almost a, an insane cliche to say thank you for your service, but my God, you had really cool service. So thank you for that. You undoubtedly saved lives everywhere. You know, and took marvelous care of your patients. So, uh, speaking for our patient community, enormous gratitude, respect. You're a legend. Um, I think one of the takeaways from this is that we're still not out of the woods in terms of exposure. I mean, Agent Orange has led to burn pits. Burn pits for like post 9 11 people are Agent Orange. You know, exposure to lubricants, jet fuels, uh, depleted uranium, uh, Doppler radar or any kind of ions, you know, I mean, just and stuff, you know, a myriad of stuff we haven't discussed. But, you know, I mean, there's still so much to be concerned with, so much to investigate. Uh, but for men who are diagnosed, I mean, you deal with what's on your plate and don't beat yourself over the head for the, 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 the marvelous time you had in the service, or even if it was a bad experience, you did the best you could. And, uh, you know, whether it means it has value to, to know that there are people you've never met that are grateful for your service or not, uh, you should feel good. I mean, you know, you're dealing with people today and you're watching this because of the people you're dealing with today who care about you and who probably like you you know, in the support groups. So, uh, so uh, three cheers for that. Uh, Captain Jones, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to our uh, one day conference thing. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that and the opportunity to speak to your group. And, and I would say that is another good news story we have right now is that unlike with the vets that came back from the Vietnam War, where they were somewhat despised and spat upon and weren't allowed to have jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I think that veterans coming back from foreign service, uh, VW, VFW, uh, the veterans of foreign wars now are are appreciated by the American public. And uh, uh, I can't tell you how many folks uh, uh, say thanks for service now compared to in the past. And uh, I think that uh, people have recognized that not only veterans have uh, specific you know, conditions that are unique to their service, but they have specific mm -hmm. contributions to make to society because of their experiences and things they can bring to the table and they're, they're welcoming them in the, in the workplace. And so those are all good news stories that we can, we can take from today's discussion. Right. All right. See you around. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great day.